It's great to see you all this morning. Good to be with you. You know, I'm just so excited about what God is doing here at Silver Creek Fellowship. I'm, I'm so excited about it. I've been doing this a long time, and I don't know that I've ever been more excited about God, what God was doing in the church that I've been involved in than, than, than what I am right now. And I hope that you have that same excitement expectation, anticipation. Because I tell you what, God's moving. And God is moving. I mean, you know what that means? Like when everything was created, God was moving. Well, God's moving right now. And God is making new creations and transforming Tens and tens and scores of lives. It's awesome to be a part of that. I hope you understand how awesome it is to be a part of that. Amen. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Let's pray. Amen. We're continuing this morning in a little study we've had. This is the fourth week since Easter. It's uh, Go Together is the, is the name of it. We've been looking at uh, various subjects out of the first four chapters of Acts, chapter four today. So <clears throat> in Acts chapter one, we see the, the church commissioned. Jesus, just before he ascended to the Father, uh, gave the, the, the famous uh, commission to the church, said that you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, go into all the world. In Acts chapter 2, we see the fulfillment of that, the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost. And (laughs) I tell you what, apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, perhaps the day of Pentecost is the most significant day that has ever been in history, because that's really the birth of the church. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 3, Kurt shared about last week, we see the church healing. The story about Peter and John at the beautiful gate. Wonderful story. And today in Acts chapter 4, we're going to see the church praying. Okay? So, Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are on their way to the temple at the hour of prayer. They encounter this man who was lame, and Peter healed the man. And I know it was really the Lord who healed him, but I'm not sure how healed the guy would have got if Peter hadn't been there. So when I say Peter healed him, I I know it was Jesus, but Jesus knows it was Peter. Okay? And I think there's an important clue in that for us. So the guy runs into the temple with them, celebrating, jumping, dancing around, kind of like Ginny was doing here last week. And uh, Ginny was healed last week, by the way. Not totally lame, but kind of lame. And she was jumping and dancing and praising God. And it seems like everybody would have been rejoicing. But unfortunately, a bunch of the religious folks weren't. They didn't think you did that kind of stuff in their church. So the guys got in trouble again, and they hauled them before the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish high council, and they went through this whole rigmarole, and the guys, the Jewish officials said, look, you guys just can't do that. And they kept saying, well... We can't not do that. And so they kind of came to a stalemate. And uh, eventually, Peter and John were released. And the first place they went, the first place they went 
was to church. They didn't go home and take a nap, get a shower, good meal. The first place they went was to church. And here's what it says in Acts chapter 4, beginning of verse 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to, you, grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Father, thank you, Lord, for what you are doing in our church today and what you have done through the church ever since this time that we're looking at. You've never been silent. You've never been still. You've never not been working and drawing men to yourself, people to yourself. And Lord, we understand as we look at the early church, a real important key was this aspect of prayer. So, Lord, teach us to pray. Help us, Lord to become effective and fervent and diligent in prayer. We thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So this bit we've read here out of Acts chapter 4 is post-Pentecost, okay? The Holy Spirit had come, and there's just a marked difference between the guys post-Pentecost and pre-Pentecost. Something incredible happened to their lives. And Rob talked about it a few weeks ago, the coming of the Holy Spirit. But if we go all the way back to Acts chapter 1, Jesus is there with the guys, giving them instruction, says, I'll give you power, the Spirit of God is coming, and then he ascends. And between the day of ascension and the day of Pentecost... There's 10 days. And so I've got this heading in my notes that says 10 strange days. They knew they were supposed to go, but Jesus told them to stay. They knew that the Holy Spirit was coming, but they had no idea what that looked like. See, we need to understand, cut these guys some slack. They had no clue what that meant. Jesus says, the Holy Spirit's coming, and they're going, oh, cool. But they had no idea. I didn't have any idea before the Holy Spirit came to my life. I had no clue. Right? They were confused. They knew that they would receive power. Jesus had told them that. And in fact, they'd had some experience with having the power of God in their lives. They'd been out, they'd been healing the sick, they'd cast out demons. But without Jesus there, they didn't know how that would work. See, there's a whole lot of things that they didn't know. But there's a couple of things that they did know. They knew to pray, and they knew to be together. Acts chapter 1, verse 13. When they had entered, this is, they came in from the Mount of Olives where Jesus had ascended. They entered into Jerusalem. They went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, Matthew, Judas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication and with with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with all his brothers. Those 10 days, these guys were pretty much living there in the upper room. The only thing they knew to do was to be together and to pray. 
So why did they feel such a need for prayer? And why did they have such confidence in prayer? Well, I think obviously it goes back to the fact that they had spent all of, the, all of that time with Jesus. Quite a ways back, when Jesus was still on the earth walking with them, one day they saw Jesus praying. Well, let me just read it to you. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Now it came to pass, as Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Like John taught his disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. That was the cry of their hearts. Now, prayer was not a foreign concept to these guys. They had been religious. They, they were Jews. You know, prayer was a big part of Jewish culture. The, the Jews had a, a liturgy, if you will. They had specific prayers that were, were to be prayed at specific times and seasons. And so prayer was not a, a foreign concept to them. And yet, they asked Jesus, would you please teach us to pray? So why would they ask him that? Well, I think it's because they looked at Jesus' prayer life and they saw something different than what they were used to. They saw something different than the way they had prayed and had seen prayer happening all the years of their lives. They watched Jesus pray and they thought, I want to pray like he prays. Because his prayers were effective. Amen. Three aspects I want to look at this morning. Three aspects of Jesus' prayer life that I think his disciples looked at and said, I, I want that kind of a prayer life. Okay, let me ask you something. Are y'all disciples of Jesus? Amen. Amen. You want to pray like Jesus prayed? Do you, want to ha do you want your prayer life to have the same kind of effect that Jesus' prayer life had? I mean, what I say is if you don't, save your breath. This isn't, prayer is not a religious activity. It's not, it's not us punching our time card. The first thing that we see about Jesus' prayer life is that it was personal. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 15, says, However the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. This was a pretty common practice. Jesus came to town, and everybody heard about Jesus being in town, and everybody came to Jesus because they needed help from Jesus. But look at the next verse. So, because the people were coming, because they had such need, because they were going to draw on him, so he himself often withdrew into the wilderness, and he prayed. And he didn't pray a liturgy. There's nothing wrong with liturgy. But Jesus' prayers were personal. He went to his Father. And he had fellowship. And he had prayer with his Father. And that energized Jesus to do the work that the Father had sent him to do. That strengthened him. That gave him the insight, it gave him the power, it gave him what he needed to be effective in touching these people's lives and meeting their needs. Amen. See, we can often think that Jesus cruised through all of these days-long ministry sessions with preaching and healing, and, and we can think, well, yeah, I mean, it was Jesus. Well, it was Jesus, but it was Jesus in the same kind of body that you and I have, one that gets tired, one that can get a little bit stressed out, one that can... And Jesus knew the need that he had, and so he would often withdraw 
to a deserted place and pray. His prayers were personal. So the disciples saw him go to pray, and they saw him come from prayer, and they saw the effect that that had as he ministered to the folks. Okay, Teach us to pray, Lord, because we see that your prayers are personal. Addressing God as his Father. Secondly, his prayers were powerful. And there's lots and lots of examples of this that we could cite. I've got one in here. Luke chapter 9. <clears throat> this is in the midst of feeding the 5,000. Jesus said to them, you give them something to eat. So they're coming to Jesus and they're going, oh, look at all these guys. Look at all these folks. We got 5,000 men and, you know, we don't have, all we got is a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And what are we going to do? And Jesus said, we'll feed them. Amen. Just like Jesus says to us, go preach the gospel and heal the sick. Well, God, we can't do that. He says, I know. Lord, how are we going to feed five? Feed feed them. You know what that means? Just get started. You give them something to eat. And they said, Lord, we've only got five loaves and two fishes. You know, a lunch for a couple of folks, maybe. Unless we go buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to the disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so. And he made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves, the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them. He prayed over his food. You all pray over your food? He blessed and broke them, and he gave them to disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and 12 baskets left over. Amen. Jesus prayed, and the effects of his prayer were the release of power. We see it. He calms storms. He casts out demons. He heals the sick. All of that as a direct result of his prayer life. And the disciples saw that, and they said, we want that. We've given up everything to be a disciple of Jesus, and if we're going to do that, then we want to do the stuff that Jesus does. And they understood, if we're going to do the stuff that Jesus does, then we got to pray the way that Jesus prayed. Thirdly, His prayers were prophetic. John 17. Famous prayer that we see Jesus pray. He says, I don't pray for these alone, but for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given to them, so that they may be one, just as we are one. His prayers were prophetic. Jesus would often pray back to the Father what the Father had spoken to him. And you know what? There aren't many more effective ways to pray than praying what to God, back to God what God has said. I think he kind of likes you quoting him to him. Amen. I mean, don't you like that? Don't you like that when your kids quote you to you? Amen. I mean, it kind of makes you... I, they're getting it. They're listening. I'm not just speaking into the air. Praying back to God what God has spoken is a prophetic thing. And there's life in it, and it's fresh, and it's alive. And I think what these guys saw 
in the prayer life of Jesus that made them say, Lord, teach us to do that. They saw a prayer life that was alive. It was fresh. It was living. It was effective. Amen. Now, ever since I've been, as long as I've known the Lord, people have said, you need to pray. And I've said, right on, amen. But I'm not interested in praying because it's the thing you should do. And frankly, I don't think God's interested in us praying because it's the thing we should do. I think God's interested in us praying so that he can move through us to accomplish his will and his purpose in the earth. And I would like to maybe expand our understanding and definition of prayer a little bit. We've always had the notion that prayer is asking God for stuff, and that's certainly a part of it. It's a big part of it. But more than that, prayer is collaborating with heaven to see God's kingdom come and God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Remember when when Jesus said, pray like this. Our Father out in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He was giving them a focus for their prayers. Saying, your prayers can do this. Bring God's kingdom to earth where his will is being done. Your prayer can do that. Every time Jesus prayed, the power of God was on display. Every time Jesus prayed, the kingdom of heaven came to earth and the will of God was done. Every time. And I don't think that that's out of the realm of possibility for us. But there are some lessons that Jesus gave us. He's still teaching us to pray. And there's some lessons that's important for us to understand, some elements that we have to have in our prayer life. Prayer lessons. Like I said, Jesus is still teaching us how to pray. The first one, it's very simple. Ask. James said you have not because you ask not. The beginning point is ask. Let our requests be made known, Paul says in Philippians. Let our requests be made known. Don't be anxious for anything, but by prayer and supplication, let your requests be known. So God's interested in hearing what you have to say about a particular situation. Luke chapter 11. Jesus said, and this is sort of in this context, if you remember, ask, teach us to pray was in Luke 11. This is also, so it's, it's, he's still talking about prayer. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And, him who no- and to him who knocks, it will be opened. If son asks, Bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to to those who ask him? Did you happen to notice how many times ask was in there? Five times in those Four verses of scripture, Jesus says, ask. Six times. Six times in five verses. So I wonder if he's trying to emphasize something there. Right? 
We must ask. You might say, what? God knows everything. He knows what we need before we know it ourselves. The Bible says that. So why ask? Because above all things, prayer is relational. It's not religious. It's relational. Above all things, what God wants is to have relationship with us. And through that relationship, to move through us to bring others into that relationship as well. And so asking is a dialogue, or it should be, between us and our Father. It's relational. Prayer is, above all things, relational. Okay? So we must ask. The next, next one is abide. James says, you don't have because you don't ask. And when you ask, sometimes you don't ask the right thing or for the right reason. Well, here's the solution to that. Abide. John 15, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so you'll be my disciples. I don't know about you, but I've read things like that over the years, and I've kind of gone, well, I know that's true, but it's sure hard to believe. Ask me what you want, and it'll get done. Ask me what you want. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. And it's real important that he put this in the context of this, of this I'm the branch, the vine, you're the branch, because that's what abiding looks like. It looks like the relationship between a branch and a vine. Pretty connected, right? Pretty together. You know, the branch doesn't have to work hard to be abiding in the vine. And the vine doesn't have to work very hard to get stuff through to the branch that's connected to it. Amen. Abiding. It, it's, it's, it's a sense of a vital connection, an ongoing flow of life from the vine to the branch. Abiding in Jesus and his word abiding in us is going to require an investment on our parts. That doesn't happen by accident. It happens on purpose. We make the choice to abide in him and that his word would abide in us. And that will direct us in our prayers if we abide in him and his word abides in us. If we abide in him and his word abides in us, our heart begins to be transformed. Our heart begins to become more and more like his heart. And the desires of our heart become the desires of his heart. And when we ask according to those desires, God is always ready to say yes and to move in power to accomplish it. Amen. Abiding. Being at home in him and having his word being at home in us. It being a place <coughs> where, where we understand that apart from that connection, we're going to wither up and we're not going to be very effective. Abiding puts us in a position to pray according to his kingdom plan. The third thing is agree. Ask, abide, agree. <clears throat> Matthew 18, and I've got this from the Passion Translation, because I just like it. Verse 19 says, Jesus, of course, speaking, he says, I give you an eternal truth. If two of you agree to ask God for something, 
in a symphony of prayer, my heavenly Father will do it for you. For wherever two or three come together in honor of my name, I'm right there with them. If two or more of you agree, asking God for something in a symphony of prayer, now that, that's, that's an accurate translation because the Greek word agree is the word symphono. Symphony, symphono. And so agreement is more than just hearing somebody pray and so, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, that's fine, but there's more to a symphony than a bunch of instrument players gathered together in one place, right? It's every instrument under the direction of the conductor playing his part, and it makes a beautiful, a beautiful sound. Amen. You ever heard the orchestra when they're warming up? Hee-haw, hee-haw, hee-haw. Why is that? Because everybody's doing their own thing. But when the guy goes, tuck, 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 when the Holy Spirit goes, tuck, 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 in the prayer meeting, and we all come under that direction, and we play our part, God says, I'll respond to that every time. I'll respond to that with power. I'll respond to that with affirmation. I'll respond to that every time. Every time. See, God, you notice here, God never says once in a while. It's every time. When we learn to ask through abiding and come into agreement, there's no force on earth or in hell that can stop our prayers from being answered. Jesus said, is it not written that my house should be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you've made it a den of thieves. So, I'm his house, you're his house, we're his house. And Jesus wants his house to be a house of prayer for all nations. Well, he's teaching us to pray so that we can be a house of prayer. We see the awesome effect that the house of prayer had those days and years right after Pentecost. World changing. World changing. A house of prayer changes the world. And Jesus is calling us. My house, I want my house to be called the house of prayer. Are you up for that? Amen. Good. Me too.